This is just a quick overview of the anatomy because most of us have sort of, uh, you know, had, if until you started doing radials again, probably didn't think much about the forearm and from second year of medical school when you're kind of working through your cadaver, maybe in first year. Um, so this is sort of what we'll talk a little bit about. Um, let's see here. The, uh, the radial artery, um, you know, in general, the sort of the range here, and it obviously it varies by the, the size of the patient. Uh, but ranges somewhere between uh, about on, on median is about 2.6 uh, millimeters in size. So if you think about it, what six French sheath looks like, most patients can accommodate um, you know, six French sheath or even uh, uh, to, for for access. And the ulnar artery is actually, although the, you see the variation on, it, is a little bit smaller. On, on on average, it's about similar in size. So there's really uh, no real reason if you have an adequately sized ulnar artery why you can't use it. Um, so it's just that oftentimes it's much more difficult to feel the pulse and then of course that's why people have used uh, the radial for arterial blood gases and art lines and everything else and hence using it for uh, transradial axis as well. Um, the arteries as you get down towards the hand and get into a range where you really are not, um, you know, I don't think we're going to go down and start doing index finger, uh, you know, access or anything like that. But I, I, uh, but I think it, uh, the, the radial is really sort of where it is. Um, these are sort of the, where the anatomically describes the variations of the arch. Obviously, we just got through saying half of us don't even really pay attention to it, but in case you're academically interested in it, there are descriptors of this. Um, there obviously are, you know, most of, the, most of them have a sort of a typical patent arch, uh, and then uh, you may have an incomplete arch. Now, the reality is there are microcapillaries that connect these two things together the entire time. And the other thing is that um, uh, your hand particularly when it's lying there flat, is not really using a heck of a lot of blood flow. It's when you're actually doing things that it starts to ramp up and, and we need more blood flow. So you can get away with occluding things for a period of time without really getting into a heck of a lot of trouble. Now, if you had the patient sort of doing hand grip exercises while you're trying to do their cath, yeah, they would probably notice that. But they're not going to be doing that while you're sort of there. So, um, but there again are variations. There's a variation where you have a medial artery. Uh, and so initially when the arm forms, there's actually one artery and eventually this one typically regresses, but not always. These are important to sort of know just because as you start looking at the forearm, you might actually see these sort of variations if you happen to be looking or doing an angiogram on the hand and want to describe what you're seeing when you're looking at it. Um, the things that people got concerned about were these sort of scenarios here where there really didn't seem to be any sort of connection of the arch. But again, even in these scenarios, there's probably some micro connections, but this likely explains why you see what you see with these Allen's tests that are, uh, that are uh, abnormal. As Marisa said, you know, it turns out a positive Allen's test uh, actually means that the arch is patent. So a negative means that it's not. And that created sort of like varus and valgus deformities, trying to remember which is what. I mean, I can't ever even remember. Why not just say it's going out or in? I mean, I, so abnormal and abnormal seems to be much more usable language if you're going to do this. Um, the brachial artery, just kind of moving to the elbow, is uh, there are several different variations in it, and these are important to be aware of because you will encounter this. And um, the key thing is that the, probably the most common thing is when the brachial actually goes over the aponeurosis of the tendon uh, for the biceps tendon. Normally, it's supposed to go underneath it. Um, that happens very commonly, but uh, it really doesn't make much of a difference for us. The key thing is that there are variations that are an accessory brachial artery where you could have two arteries going up the arm rather than one. And that's important to know about because you can easily get the catheter up the accessory brachial and not know about it. Uh, in particular, this, you know, if you do enough of this, you'll get a catheter into the accessory break. You'll realize you can get a four French catheter up there. When you start putting a guide up there, bam, will not go. Okay, and what's usually happened is you've sort of rammed into that. Um, again, this is sort of why you just don't want to be, you know, a bull in a china shop doing things from the wrist. If if things are not going, something's wrong. But you can find out, inject some dye, and see what's going on. And you pretty quickly it usually becomes quite apparent as to what what's the problem is, and you can kind of figure out what where to, what you need to do to uh, to address the problem. But this is one of these things that you potentially will encounter. The other thing is that there's a current a recurrent radial artery um, that oftentimes comes around. This is a key thing that I always worry about going through the wrist, which is why. Uh, you know, if you're using the wire or if you're letting the techs advance the wire like I've been doing, because I like people to kind of be trained and know how to do stuff, and I, if I can't do it myself, is that um, not to really zip the wire through here, because you potentially could get into one of these things and then potentially damage it, and you don't want that to happen. So just again, you know, move, you don't want to go, you know, microscopically slow, but you want to be, you know, if you hit something that it's going to stop, and you're not really going to really push hard on it when you're pushing the wire, otherwise you'll, you'll bang into things. Um, Sometimes there are variations in the way the artery comes off. So this bra accessory brachial artery can oftentimes come off of uh, the axillary or even off the proximal, mid, or distal uh, brachial artery. And so the radial will actually have a source where it rejoins way upstream. So again, it's just to be aware of that. So if you actually start flooring the arm, 
and the catheter seems to weigh the heck out here where you expected it to be over someplace else, but if things seem to be going okay, you don't need to, be, I mean, it is really hard to move an arter, a catheter through a non-vascular structure in the arm, I'll just tell you that. You can't, it's, you're gonna know that you're not there. So you're likely in a blood vessel, but you're just in something different, okay? You're probably in an anatomic variant, and again, it's important to be aware of that, so when, if you fluoro and you see where the heck is the catheter, that's, that you understand what's going on. Um, Equally importantly, if there's a, the, typically the way there's, there's a connection between the brachial and the radial here. In many cases, there is a loop here, and the radial loop in the 90s used to be a contraindication to the radial approach. The problem was you never knew when that was going to happen. Now I've learned that's wrong. We've also learned from radiologists that being afraid of loops is really a, silly. Uh, and if you ever watch those guys at work, they'll take a splenic artery that goes, you know, has 14 curly cues in it and just take a wire down, straighten the whole thing out to get to the spleen. And so, and they, and they don't even think twice about it. Similarly, there's no real problem why you can't go through a radial loop and straighten it out. You're not going to do anything that's going to really harm the vessel in that way. So uh, we've learned that, uh, you know, the radial loop certainly would not be a reason not to kind of just go put the wire beyond the loop, just watch what you're doing, be careful, and, and keep going. Um, Again, uh, this is sort of, again, what I was talking about. When you start seeing this connection not be normal, particularly if there's a loop here, more often than not, there's going to be an accessory brachial artery. The reason this is important is that if you get to the loop, you very well could easily put the wire up here and not be aware of it, and then get into this, this loop up here and then find out this is a very small vessel and not be able to advance a catheter or potentially damage it. So uh, if you start seeing you know, resistance, that's why the rule of thumb is if you get resistance, stop. Now, this is sort of common sense. But the thinking is, these are the things you want to start looking for when you start looking at the variations in the anatomy here, and particularly with the loops and the accessory brachial arteries. Um, now, in the, you know, and these, are, these are all the varying studies that have actually described the variations in anatomy. The most recent study was done mostly because of the, the surgeons were interested in using the uh, radial for bypass surgery, and so they wanted to describe all the variations in anatomy they would see. Um, many studies date back to the you know, 19th century in terms of descriptors or in the, you know, the early 20th century in terms of variations of the brachial radial artery, the superficial brachial artery, the superficial radial artery, and then sort of duplications of the arteries. And in general, what they found was in about 11% um, uh, of the time will sort of be accessory uh, or a secondary brachial radial artery. Uh, so at one in 10 cases, you're going to see one of these, these variations. Now, many times you may not even know it because half, if the catheter goes through it, you may go up, go do the whole case and never have fluoroed anything, particularly since we're not fluoroing anything anymore, and, uh, and, and do the case without being aware of it. But again, the point of being aware of it is that when you actually do encounter resistance, you can understand what you're looking at. Um, other anomalies, um, again, so again, most times there's one brachial artery. Uh, and every now and then there's sort of this uh, uh, group of patients that will basically have uh, an accessory brachial artery, which is about 10% of the time. Um, in terms of the forearm, again, there are different variations in terms of different duplications of things, even having sort of three arteries that, that are there and so forth, and these have all been sort of described depending on which anatomic series you'd see. They're sort of more of academic interest than really not uh, anything else. Um, the aortic arches, you may remember back to embryology. Again, this is definitely going back to medical school unless you happen to be a pediatrician, I suppose. Uh, but it's cobbled together by a bunch of different uh, components of the, uh, the aortic arches from the initial um, uh, aortic sac. Um, the reason that's important is, again, there's a lot of variations in the aortic arch. The key thing that we worry the most about, of course, is when the subclavian really does this, and particularly if you're coming from the right. And that's why many people have moved towards just encountering these problems and just saying, I'm giving up. I don't want to ever see this again. I'm just going to go from the left, left radial. Uh, mostly because more often than not, it's a much more straight shot to get into the ascending aorta. The challenge is you just got to work from over there. Or if you're, you know, maybe bizarre like I am and enjoy working through these challenges of a tortuous inominate artery, uh, then, um, the, uh, uh, then you're going to encounter this periodically. These are very, I've, I've seen this once in now 10 years of doing this, um, where we had a, it was truly coming off the descending aorta, and it is really a bear to get around that. You could try and spend an hour trying to get the catheter to come up around and over and down, and you're not going to be able to do an intervention anyway. Frankly, if you encounter this, probably the right thing to do is just to say, hey, I'm going to go over your left arm and get on with the case. Um, because, and, and from the patient's perspective, we're all used to thinking about this from the groin and how awful it is to have your groin poked and everything else. Most patients, when you ask them about getting a needle poke in the wrist, it's basically like an IV poke. And it's likely, unless your nurses are getting your IV every single time upstairs, they've already been poked a couple times already, and they're not really complaining about that unless they've really got, you know, turned into a pincushion. So 
a second, you know, going over the other side, yeah, you have to re you know, break down and reset up. When you encounter something like this, it's going to be worth it in terms of time. So if you wind up seeing something like that, you know, unless you really think you're going to, or you want to have some time to try to, you know, play around with your catheter skills and so forth. But in the American healthcare system, you know, I think we're all sort of under time constraints. You're probably getting more efficient just going over the other side. Um, anyway, uh, vascular rings are just sort of interesting to be aware of. Again, we sort of know about this from the femoral stuff anyway. Um, the last thing I will say is that there are uh, several predictors of arterial tortuosity, and this is one of the things I try to use when I'm sort of clinical. I like to go right if I can, but in terms of looking or trying to predict where are those, or where are you going to get into trouble with the innominate uh, artery uh, giving you a lot of tortuosity? And there are several predictors that have actually worked into showing that. One is age, two is uh, gender, which is uh, females tend to be a little bit more tortuous, uh, and then short stature, uh, and then hypertension. And so, uh, and tobacco use. And these are all sort of things that basically translate into peripheral arterial disease or equally importantly, short old people, usually and particularly short women. Uh, and if I see something like that, I usually say I'm by a priori, I'm just going to go left because again, I'm not, I don't want to get into having to deal with this if I don't have to. Um, but again, uh, that's sort of a, a rule of thumb. If I was sort of looking for a reason why I might say go left or go right, that would be, that would be sort of a clinical predictor that people have used. So again, uh, in conclusion, there's a lot of variations in the hand. Uh, again, nowadays, we really aren't paying a lot of attention to the Allen's test, maybe perhaps with the very most extremely abnormal one. And even then, I would kind of note it and probably still proceed on. Um, there are variations in the ulnar radial anatomy. It's important to be particularly aware of what's going on at the elbow so that when you shoot your angiogram, you can kind of be aware of what you expect to see and what the variations are. And then finally, um, the arch about particularly the, uh, the subclavian that comes off of the descending aorta. Uh, or the so-called bovine arch um, yeah, can be a little bit problematic sometimes in terms of negotiating from the right wrist. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm.